Hi, this is Mimi Chen with AZAM News. Meet the Case Sisters, Charlene and Leanne, two very creative award-winning sisters who complement each other with their skills. Charlene is a singer, songwriter, dancer, producer, while Leanne is an award-winning filmmaker with a very hot web series called The Blessing. Well, where does all this creativity come from? Let's find out. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> well, I think our parents are deeply creative people. We're fortunate because we've had the access and the privilege to grow up in America and be surrounded by lots of creative folks. And Leanne and I are constant supports for each other with our creativity. Um, our mom is a very talented interior decorator and has such an eye for aesthetic and color. Our dad is a writer and a very sensitive um, absorber of, of of movies and music. And he really like is such a deep appreciator of storytelling. Um, but both of them grew up very poor in Singapore. And so they didn't really have the resources to do, to live their craft, to push their craft to its fullest. And so I think Leanne and I are kind of making up for lost time in a way. So was being a singer songwriter or filmmaker, something that you both uh, dreamed of as children? Yeah, we had a pretty well-rounded childhood and our mom always surrounded us with uh, art. Like she loves musicals and music and singing and, and stuff. But yeah, we were, I think like many uh, children of immigrants told, you know, go to college, get your degree, get a stable job and et cetera, et cetera. And so Charlene was the first one to branch off and say, I want to be a musician, uh, to which they did not react well to. I was a guinea pig. <laughs> And then <laughs> I kind of snuck off after working, uh, you know, in the corporate world for nine years and didn't really tell them I was going on my creative adventure. And I now they've kind of like sort of accepted, but don't really know what I do. But as long as I don't ask them for money or anything, then they're good. So, <laughs> Well, when the end movies are winning Oscars and all over Netflix and stuff, they'll understand. <laughs> Parents always want the best for their kids, right? <laughs> So what kind of recognition have you received so far? I've done, I want to say, pretty well in the grant space. Both of us actually like have applied to the New York City Women's Grant for Artists, which has been um, super helpful, like in our latest projects. And then um, my short film won uh, the uh, New York Short Film Festival, which was great. Yeah. And uh yeah, so that's been really great. You can see uh, uh, the series on, as a whole is playing at the Greenpoint Film Festival next month. So, yeah, not Oscars yet or anything, but, you yeah, know, everything's a of, It's a matter of time. Colleen, <laughs> are you the kind of uh, musician who stays at home and just records, or do you get out and perform? I do. Um, I've been performing for the last 15 years. I actually studied English in college. That was my original plan to be an English teacher. Um, and then I just immediately fell into the open mic scene, found my community there of other fellow artists and songwriters who became some of my closest friends. And then we all moved to New York together and we got a practice space before getting an apartment and I got a job waiting tables and I started gigging and went on my first tour when I was 24. And I've really been touring all over the country and all over the world ever since. I've been really fortunate to be involved in several different groups, both as my own solo project um, and playing guitar for other bands. Um, I have so many stories. I don't even know where to start. One of, one of the bands was a Harry Potter tribute band um, include that, <laughs> that involved my good friend from college, Darren Chris, as Harry Potter, who wrote all of the music for it. Um, another group that I played with was a electronic pop band called Bright Light, Bright Light, where I, the drummer of that band I became friends with and then set up with Leanne, to whom she is now married. <laughs> yeah. When you talk about Harry Potter, were you Cho Chang? I was not Cho Chang. Actually, that's a hilarious. That's a joke in the Harry Potter musical where the songs are from. They made Cho Chang a white girl. <laughs> yeah, they whitewashed Cho mm -hmm. Chang and uh, naughty naughty indeed. <laughs> yeah, they're like. But I, I I appreciated the bait and switch though because that's what you you assume that it's like 
going to be an Asian person and my doppelganger was always Cho Chang. But I, I thought that that was an interesting comedic move on their part. So part of the reason why I decided to do an interview with you two is because I came across Leanne's TikTok and it pointed out some very interesting facets about uh, the evolution of American music as pertains to Asians and then how you were addressing it with your sister's music video. So do you want to do and give us a, a little bit of a rundown on that? Sure. Um, so... I kind of discovered that TikTok was an extremely powerful tool for promoting whatever creative projects that you're doing. Um, so I had been using it to talk about behind the scenes things of my mini series. And then uh, lately, as we've been releasing music videos, I would just kind of talk about where the concept came from. Uh, for each music video that we've been doing. And so this music video we actually made five years ago, uh, but I just pulled it up as a, uh, you know, this is like my directing uh, notes on it. And also I used the song in the final episode of the web series. But yeah, largely it was just that uh, remembering back in the early 2000s, uh, Gwen Stefani had an entourage called the Harajuku Girls, which were four uh, Japanese ladies that followed her around uh, and were contractually obligated to only speak Japanese in public. And so you see them in Hala Batgirl, you know, dancing behind her and uh, on the red carpet during that era, they were uh, just always flanking her not speaking as far as I remember. And so it was just a weird moment that uh, it doesn't seem like a lot of people talked about. And then, uh, you know, kind of digging more into the pop culture history of this and um Avril Lavigne had a video called Hello Kitty uh which people had pointed out that she did make in Japan um with a Japanese crew but similarly a white woman with these emotionless silent uh Asians behind her doing dance moves and you know not being the front woman in the situation and then Finally, Katy Perry, which I, I don't think there's really any defense for what she did, but she uh, went straight yellow face and, uh, you know, like had slanty eye makeup, like put her, you know, her her hair was black, I believe, in the AMA performance and then had a an outfit on that was combining a kimono and a chiang sam uh, or kapow and... You know, uh, and a lot of uh, dancers behind her uh, taking Asian culture into her performance, but not uplifting any Asian people. Uh, so I just kind of went through the quick history of what that was and then said, you know, for our music video, why not have Char be a front woman and have two white ladies behind dancing? And why not? <laughs> We've never seen it before. So it was just a fun twist of uh, visuals for us. I noticed that there definitely have been some changes since uh, the videos that you pointed out toward Asian Americans and the pandemic apparently has uh, increased awareness in some ways. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think in maybe since the pandemic and i mean definitely there's been a long history of asian american activists in america um but i guess for my generation having us kind of claim the slogan asian and loud is uh i think behind that is us saying that we are tired of the silent emotionless uh and mousy stereotype that americans have uh portrayed us as in american media and I think in these uh, instances, like it was definitely perpetuating that stereotype that Asian women are docile and submissive and don't speak up. And, you know, that has been OK, that portrayal for many, many years in movies and film and music videos. And I think now as uh, women that are trying to make our own art in the world and have a voice in the world, we just don't want to, per to keep um, perpetuating that image. <laughs> Charlene, I understand that you have a new project that you've been working on. Yeah, I just released an EP. It's called Neon God. 
it's got five songs on it. I wrote every song on it and produced it. Um, I had co-producers on the project as well, and I'm really proud of it. So watch the videos that Leanne and I created and go stream it on any platform. And we can find this on some of your socials. Like, um, what are some of the platforms you're on? Yeah, I have a YouTube channel. Um, you can search for my name, Charlene K. You can search for just my last name, K-A-Y-E, and I will come up. So do you have a goal in mind? I am a singer-songwriter and a storyteller at heart. I really pay attention to lyrics. I love interesting wordplay. I love references. I think that music has been such a helpful and life-saving tool for me. Um, I'm so grateful that I have it as a medium for me to sort things out. And also it's become very clear to me throughout the conversations that we've just had and through talking to Leanne, through the events of the world and culture over the past few years, that it's been it's become my goal, not just to tell my own story and to make art for my own delight and amusement, but also to be a beacon for younger Asian artists who might not see themselves in the work they do, because that was a big part of my struggle coming to terms with my identity as an artist and realizing that if I didn't pursue this, I would get sick and I would not be happy or healthy in the body that I'm in. And so I'm now in a place where I'm content to joyfully pursue it. And I know that I deserve it. And I want to continue making music for as long as I possibly can, despite the confines of white supremacy and ageism and racism and misogyny. Can you tell us a little bit about your web series, Leanne? Yeah, it is about um, largely the man that my, uh, that my sister introduced me to and our interracial, intercultural uh, courtship and marriage. And so it's about a guy that wants to propose to his girlfriend. Uh, but the first episode, which started as a standalone short film, was about him needing to ask her immigrant Chinese mother for her blessing. And so that short film is just the two of them um, having a conversation about like what it means, uh, what marriage means and like what's important in a marriage, especially like with these two cultures coming together. And so that film um, did the film festival circuit and then I used it to apply for the New York City Women's Grant and got the money to serialize uh, the rest of the story. So now I have six episodes in total and he goes and meets each member of the family. Each episode is a different member of the family. And so he meets the dad, the aunties, the grandma, the stepdad, and then in the final episode, the sister. And so it all does tie together actually. And then Char's music is in the end credits of each episode. And she also scored the series and incorporated her pop songs into actual uh what do you call them compositions or yeah actual, they're, they're, the actual they're, score there you go <laughs> mm -hmm. so is this collaboration going to continue do you have other projects in mind yeah we're always we're always brainstorming and always making things and i've said this in many interviews and i'll, I'll say it again that i think leanne is the most important artistic collaborator in my lifetime and mm -hmm. It's one thing to make the music and the albums that chronicle my life. And I, uh, it's another thing that I know not every artist has, but to have this very special aspect of it, which is making the visual components of it. And I consider that just as important as, to the release as the, the music itself. So I'm so grateful that I have a visual collaborator that not only knows exactly what I was going through and can hear every version from the very first voice memo demo, all the way to the mastered version that ends up out in the world. Um, and also somebody who can really hold me accountable in making sure that I'm delivering the most truthful visual counterpart to it. And it, there, it's, there's a way of making sure that I'm at my highest integrity as an artist because I can't, I can't lie. No, I wouldn't want to, but there's somebody who's really like, how can we get this over the net? And how can we take your experience and make it, something that will resonate with people, something that resonates with with her as somebody who is such an empathetic, compassionate, nuanced artist as well. And it's so fun and it's so satisfying. And I just can't wait to see the work that we come up with in the years to come. And what next for you, Leanne? 
Um, well, the exciting news is that um, since creating the blessing, uh, I was able to get representation. So I signed with Issa Rae's company, uh, Color Creative, her management company. And thank you. And now we're working on um, two features that I... Um, one of them we are is in development and we're going to be pitching uh, to streamer soon. And then the other one I'm uh, pitching the idea to, uh, to people. So I've got two movies and then a TV show. So yeah, hopefully just moving forward in the narrative space on bigger projects now. And uh, yeah, like uh, to speak back to like the sister connection, like it's, uh, I feel like Char has been a big, uh, definitely somebody that I could lean on as far as having the courage to say the words yourself, because I think that music videos, I love them and like always want to do them. Uh, but they, this is kind of the first time that I've been writing my own words, like with the web series and, and the features. So that's been a very exciting and scary journey, but it's always good to have somebody that like has been there and knows how to be courageous and putting it out there. We all know that the pandemic induced a bunch of anti-Asian sediment. And has that impacted your work? Yeah, I mean, I think for better and for worse, there's mm -hmm. been a rise in the awareness of how Asians are treated in this country, especially because of COVID and for it becoming synonymous with the China virus and all this the straight up the straight up murders that have happened and the outright hatred, which we've all experienced on a microaggression level. And now we're seeing it at a macroaggression level and it's shocking and disheartening to see it happening in New York city where a lot of these outright acts of violence and stabbings are happening a mile away from me in, in Chinatown. That's pretty scary, huh? Yeah. And really it was, so I, during the first round of anti-Asian attacks that we were seeing um, because of the pandemic, I had this idea to start a podcast that spotlighted Asian musicians. And I didn't actually launch it until the at the spa shootings in Atlanta in March of 2021. And then I was like, I can't sit on this anymore. I really need to make this a tangible entity. And so I launched this podcast called Golden Hour, which is me having conversations with other American, Asian American and global Asian musicians. And originally it was going to be like any Asian creative, but then I decided to make it more niche because my experience specifically is what does it look like to, what does Asian American music sound like? There's such a rich history of black music in America. And one could actually argue that all American music stems from black music and its roots in slavery. And there's also a rich history of, of white musicians ripping off black artists because mm -hmm. that's what the culture found popular at the time, like just going back to the minstrel shows that would happen in the 1800s. Um, but there's no de definitive his history of what it means to be an Asian American artist. And this is something that I talk about with activist and musician Nobuko Miyamoto, who protested alongside the Black Panthers in the 60s during the original civil rights movement. And she played on John Lennon. She played. She met Yoko Ono and John Lennon in the 70s and when she played on the Johnny Carson show. And she was just such a legend that not too many people know about because, again, it speaks to our invisibility as activists and this model minority trope created by white supremacy to pit us against Black people when we were first building the railroads and like becoming a genuine um entity as not just a minority but somebody like a, a like an ethnic group that was becoming more and more populous so anyway this woman nobuko miyamoto she wrote what is considered the first asian american folk album and it was put out by the smith by the smithsonian's music label and she has such an incredible story and what part of what connected her and i was her saying it would be weird if i as a Japanese American drew from the traditional music of Japan, because that's not where I grew up. I wouldn't want to play the Koto and use that to tell my story because what authentically feels like my musical expression are the protest, are the protest songs of Bob Dylan and Joe Mitchell and Woody Guthrie and these, these artists that came up in the civil rights movement alongside her. And that's just as American as anyone else that lives here. 
And so it's this fighting to be seen and be understood for as who we for who we are as individuals and not being painted as a monolith that is silent and expressionless and well behaved because that truly is just an invention of people in power trying to keep us down. Yeah, like it, as far as like the shift that you're talking about, I think it really is people rethinking the model minority attitude and behavior. And I remember thinking about that a lot um, during the attacks of like, we've done everything that this country asked of us to be good and silent and obedient and, you know, keep your head down and work hard. And we're still getting attacked. So what does that mean? Like the strategy isn't working. And so, yeah, coming back to the Asian and loud attitude of just really taking pride. And I think that's something that we can learn from the LGBT movement of like pride um, in who we are in our stories. And if anything, yes, there have been like definite negatives, but seeing the Asian community support each other, I think has been really incredible. And especially with the blessing, when I was going around for my um, premiere party, I was asking Asian uh, AAPI open businesses, you know, would you like to donate, you know, uh, some some product or some food or some of your uh, uh, some of your beverages? And really, they're all small businesses that didn't have a ton of money, but they were like, "Yes, I want to support you, and we have to support each other." And that was like really heartwarming and beautiful. Um, I also wanted to say that part of what makes my work with Leanne so satisfying is that she is so good at putting these little Easter eggs into our videos that have these messages, like undo undoing those racist tropes that maybe no one would notice except for us. And that's why I'm so glad that Leanne has found this audience on TikTok where she can break down those moments. Like it's, it was intentional that there were two white girls behind me for the you video. Mm -hmm. And the, the most, one of our most recent videos for my song, Neon God is exceptionally personal to us because we both grew up being forced to play piano and violin. This is also another Asian trope. And we actually cast these two little girls that resemble Leanne and I to carry these violins and then smash them. And it was very meaningful to me because when I was on tour with my old band, San Fermin, I experienced so much microaggression and so much outright racism. People asking me if I was Michelle Kwan at gas stations and like telling me that I brought great honor and glory to my people at other mm -hmm. locations. Just really, really ignorant and hurtful things. And it made me realize that if you don't live in a diverse metropolis, like I'm blessed to, and, and you know what, even if we do live in New York, people get killed. But, you know, especially being in the center of the country and experiencing this, it made me realize like, wow, this is really how Asian people are perceived in large swaths of the country. And this question that I got asked over and over again was, oh, you are you the violin player? Because mm -hmm. they would see this violin that was actually played by my bandmate, who is not Asian. and But they associated it with me because there's the association of what an Asian musician is in America is that you must be a classical musician or you're a K-pop performer. So mm -hmm. it just really reminded me of the limiting belief that a lot of people believe Asian, Asian artists to be. And... Um, I thought so for that reason we took that violin and we wanted to smash that like we were smashing that stereotype mm -hmm. and we hope they continue smashing stereotypes the case sisters here on azam news